Hello, welcome to this month's Q&A MQ video. Alright, so something interesting happened uh, as I was looking at these comments and watching the vid other videos. There is a little theme that's running through this particular uh, month's questions and it tied into uh, a video that I've, I, was saying, I saw as, as a response to uh, it, it Beer did to another guy's channel. So there's uh, <clears throat> a guy by the name of Vince Vin Venturella. Vince Venturella. I'll put a link to his channel down below. Uh, he has a weekly topic question, you know, and so it's actually a pretty good question. And I figure, well, since it ties into a couple of questions I got from the comments below, thank you guys. Uh, I kind of weave that one in. So I'm going to start with that answer because it sets the stage for the other questions. All right. <clears throat> so Vince. Venturella asked the question in his last update is what motivates you to get a new army? So, well, I've got six right now, and I started with the orcs because I had to, because that was part of the starter set, right? Um, and I've added two from there. I was I chose this my, my initial army as Tau because I I wanted to learn a game using what seemed like a system or sorry, a, a faction that was my play style, and it really is. <clears throat> but of course I've added quite a few others, and I still do have the orcs. I didn't sell them off. So, looking to answer this question, it really boils down to there has to be three components that fall together. The first one is I have to be able to come up with a story behind them, okay? I need it to be more than just a bunch of, you know, models and stats to go fight on, on a tabletop. <clears throat> there has to be a story behind it, you know, not necessarily the, the official fluff, but a story for the, the models that I have in, in my particular army. So that's the first thing that has to happen. <clears throat> the second is it would be really good if, and it's actually, it's, it's an important piece, if there were conversion possibilities within the army. It doesn't have to be, but that definitely piques my interest and leans me really heavily toward that because I like to just be creative that way. But then finally, and this is uh, something I think we can all kind of relate to, is it has to be an army that, uh, you know, looks good to, you know, the, the aesthetic. It, it has to be an army that you like looking at and you like having, you like the idea of painting, okay? Because not all of us, I'm sure not all of us love painting every, you know, look, look forward to it every day, but to get through those doldrums, the times when it's hard to paint, it's nice to be looking forward to it a little bit. Uh, so those three things have to come together in order for me to choose a new army. And <clears throat> I have, so that's why I've got six. I still have my orcs because I did come up with a story for them, and they're full of conversions. Uh, the Eldar, Dark Eldar, Tyranid wove together with a single story. And there are numerous conversions. Those things are almost all conversions, which is just fantastic. The guard, there's conversions in there, and a really cool story back, backdrop I have. And it, there was something I was trying to accomplish in the way I wanted to build the army. And so that's why I was able to add those, because it, it met those criteria. All right, so now if you're interested in the rest of the army stuff, I've got two of the three more questions that came in uh, this last month, and so we'll kind of dive into those. The first question I'm going to go to is going to be from DM Dave. So, do you have fluff reasons for why you own all of your armies and warbands? Okay, I know the Exodites kind of do, but what about the Guard Tower and all, even the Polish Armor Division? Okay, so, interesting question. Uh, I hope I'm going to answer this one right. Uh, or as far as the way you, you intended, what your, your information you're looking for. Um, there are fluff reasons, okay? Um, the orcs, I didn't want to get just sell off you know, those Black Reach pieces, and with the conversion possibilities, I just I wanted to have that. But again, I had to have a reason, a story behind it, so I came up with my own story for it. Uh, and actually, I think I put that story into my studio armor review for the orcs. If not, I'm going to put out a separate story time 
uh, just for that Grimmack tribe uh, history because <clears throat> that's the whole reason uh, it exists and ties into the rest of mine. Now, the Orcs, Tau, and Guard, and Exodus, it's all tie together in a unified uh, story. It all kind of falls together. Uh, it, my armies don't have to do that. Uh, it just works out well because I kind of like to mix and match some of the, some of the things. But the Orcs are, are uh, mercenaries, so they can ally with the rest of them. All right, so now the Tau, uh, obviously that didn't get that for really for fluff. Uh, I got it because it's my shooting style. Sorry, it's my fighting style. Uh, it has all the components, you know, infantry, armor, shooting, uh, some close combat with the crew. It has conversion possibilities, too, uh, which I didn't know at the time. And air support, which I love flyers. Just, I love aircraft. So anyway, that's the reason I have that. So it's not so much a fluff reason for having the Tau. But I did write up a whole fluff background for my Tau Sept, because I wanted something different than everybody else. Um, Exodites do have a fluff background. I liked the idea of these sort of outcasts of a type uh, who kind of turned their back on their society because they didn't like where it was going to take a simpler approach. Yeah, I kind of like that. I'm an outdoorsman, so it kind of ties in well there. There's a whole pioneering kind of thing, uh, roughing it, living off the land. It just kind of, I, I liked it. I liked that approach story and so I wanted to actually provide that models for that and I, once I saw you know the exit codexes what do you call it the uh, their fan base you know fan codexes I thought oh, it would be kind of cool because there's a lot of conversions I could do kind of stuff and so I did write the story of you know my version once I figured out how to do it um, but that part of their history and their attitude kind of I really kind of liked it so that's why I went with the, the exodites now the guard, that one's an interesting, um, because the guard, just in general, I don't know that I would have gone for it. Uh, however, as, as I looked at what was possible, I realized I could do something that I thought was really cool. Because I was going to be going into Flames of War uh, prior to hitting 40k, but you know, I was looking for a tabletop game to get my boys interested in. Uh, you know, do the modeling and the painting and the history and all that kind of cool stuff. It didn't work. <laughs> I mean, it did. We kind of were interested, but they thought 40K was cooler. Uh, it didn't hurt their cause that their high school teacher was big on 40K. He's a history teacher, so I, I can't fault him. Uh, so, okay, so they went with that. I decided to do the same thing. So go dive in with them. Well, I was looking in Flames of War to go for doing Polish First Armor Division, and I'll explain the why there when I talk about the Bolt Action Army. Um, so, I looked at the Imperial Guard, and I thought, well, well, you know what? I could build a World War II army, you know, following the table of organization equipment for the Polish First Armor Division, or the, uh, the Wehrmacht, one of the, um, you know, like an actual rifle uh, platoon, even some of the tank companies I could do too, but I wanted to use, build an army based on, you know, World War II tables, you know, their organizations. And it just, I, wanted, I just decided, hey, you know, this will work, I could do this. And I think I could build a balanced, playable army that way. So, that's what I dove into it. And of course, it turned out I could do some conversions there too. There was a lot of opportunity. It was, uh, almost became a scale model, uh, blend kind of thing, because it's sort of World War One-ish, uh, sort of World War Two-ish, sort of like my scale model background, but anyway, that idea of working with that uh, historical perspective of the way you build armies, I wanted to use that. Now, ended up that I did write a story for how this army is not part of the Imperium anymore, and <clears throat> why it has the look it does, why it has the models it does, what have you. And so it turned out it ties into the same solar system as the, the Sept world is in. <clears throat> now the Exodites um, are in the same world, so everything plays in the same solar system. So those are the fluff reasons, if you will, for the, the different armies that I've got. Now the one 
that I don't have fluff for yet is the Skitari. Because I happen to have five models that are really just an afterthought because I needed to, I bought those Electromages and the Skitari to make my Tech Priests and the uh, Tech Priest Novices for that Necron campaign that I wrote a few years ago. Well, I got five Skitari models I don't know what to do with. No story yet. Uh, I may not actually have a story for them. Who knows? I might just add them in to an army list, just a narrative one, just to have fun. You know, I don't know. So, nothing there, uh, fluff-wise. Now, as far as the bolt-action one, uh, there is a fluff reason for that. And it is, I mean, it, it boils down to the fact that I am a huge history buff, especially World War II history. And being Polish, as being background, I mean... Kind of got to go with it, you know. It's, I really enjoyed, um, I have a sense of pride about, you know, because growing up um, in the Chicago area, like I did, I wasn't in Chicago, I was in the outskirts, but, you know, I grew up in a time when still, you know, there were Polak jokes, and Polish were not, they were the butt of jokes, they were not thought of highly, and this, to actually see historical uh, documentaries and historical realities of, you know, how important they were, how well they fought, you know, the, they, they, they were, they were up on top, they were, they may not, have, they may have, they may have lost World War, their, their invasion, but they put up a very, very good fight without help from anyone, but being attacked from two sides. The French and the British worked together to help delay the, the Germans. Six weeks, France fell. The last of the Polish uh, resistance gave up slightly before six weeks. But, you know, that's not too bad if you think about it. That means they, they were fighting real well with less than adequate equipment. So, you know, there's a lot of good reasons. It, made me, it makes me proud, you know, heritage-wise. So I wanted to uh, try to replicate and honor that, if you will, by going with the Polish 1st Armored Division, actually doing the Polish... Uh, infantry during the uh, early war uh, to kind of marry up the Polish heritage aspect and history with my scale modeling. And that's how I chose the Polish for the bolt action scenario. Alright, so that's how that worked. Now, if what this next question that I'm going to deal with is actually from Inquisitor Jones, and he actually wanted to see my collection. <clears throat> Everything. So, I went ahead and did that. Now, instead of having you guys go to the Studio Army Reviews, where I go into all the detail about everything, uh, and a little summary at the beginning, uh, intro to it, I'm just going to give you a quick walkthrough of these armies in the order that I started them. Not necessarily the order I wanted to start them, but the order they actually started uh, coming into shape. So let's take a f uh, look at the Orcs, which are the first army, thanks to Blackridge. And we started with the Black Reach set, uh, so I got the Orcs, my son got the Space Marines. And from this little band, it grew to this. <laughs> Alright, so just a quick run through. The standard or war, war boss, and the five basic Black Reach knobs, the 20 Black Reach boys. That's where I got the maroon scheme started. Okay, <clears throat> from there, um, I basically went on a craze for Def Coptas, including making my own uh, Def Choppa, if you will, Verge conversion. I uh, went ahead and expanded, got a few more knobs, power claws, and what have you. And then some old, 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 old Warhammer orcs. Uh, kind of cut them up and made uh, regular boys out of them. So I've got 30 boys now. <clears throat> made a custom warp head out of my, uh, just a knob torso, and just made warp lightning and everything going on, so that I do have a warp head now. Uh, this is my Mad Doc Grotznik. Uh, actually, it's Doc Who. Uh, this was going to be the Sonic Screwdriver kind of approach. Uh, this is back when I was able, you were able to buy Cyborg 
bodies that actually you know, gave you a five up invuln on your uh, bunch of boys. So I, I was going to do an entire mob of those, but they changed the rules and I, before I got to that project, so I was good. <laughs> anyway, moving on, we did a, I did a whole bunch of mega knobs. These are all custom uh, green stuff and bits and what have you. This guy, this one usually doubles as a big mech. So that's another leader I'll get. <clears throat> By having a big mech, it allows me to have these grot tanks. I have four of the standard Forge World ones, plus a couple uh, from, I kind of kit bash from a 70 second scale. about tanks? <clears throat> there's my Smurf mob. Uh, there's a whole backstory to how why they're blue. These are my Gretchens, uh, 29 boys, or, sorry, 29 Grots, and that's Papa Smurf right there. Okay, uh, I do have another 10 boys, or sorry, Grots. Uh, these guys are with bows. Uh, grot blasts are short range, so I figured Grot bows will be short range. And they just happen to be, uh, if you think of uh, uh, some fireworks that, you know, like bottle rockets, that's kind of the approach these are. They fire these things off and they've got a projectile that uh, explodes an impact kind of thing. Uh, truck, or it can actually double as a buggy. That's an old, old Gorkamorka buggy, but I use it as a truck most of the time. Three big, uh, sorry, uh, big tracks or tracks. War tracks, that's it. <clears throat> now there's my Flash Gits. Nine models, those are all custom. Uh, with their custom classic car ride. That's a, usually counts as a battle wagon. Uh, I use it, it opens up battle wagon, and allows me to shoot out of it, and that's, that keeps them real safe. Uh, moving on to, there's my Dakajet, my big, what do they call this, uh, oh wow, what do you, what do they call it, Mecha Dread, yeah, and then that's my Junka, that was my first, it was going to be a looted wagon, but it didn't work out to be that with the way the rules worked, couldn't see how you could possibly transport them, so anyway, it worked out when I looked at the Imperial Armor list. It's my, uh, now it's a Mech Boy Junka. That was my first Battle Fortress. Sorry, Battle Wagon. It usually does come in as a Battle wa uh, Fortress, though, because it's so large. It's the size of a Land Raider, but taller. So it's much bigger than a regular Battle Wagon. Uh, there's a little truck I kind of put together from an old car kit. There's a buggy. Uh, for a Gorkamorka buggy with superstructure I put on to make a truck for my tank busta mob. Okay. <clears throat> Over here, there's uh, some more of my tank bustas, including the uh, knob. Back here, there's a regular traditional battle wagon. This is my Blitz Obama. It's an Avenger kit, uh, 148 scale, cut down. And then, uh, what are I, I don't think I missed anything. That looks like the whole thing. So that is the entire Orc Horde. Now if you want more information, again, you can go to my uh, playlist for the Studio Army review for Orcs. It goes into it. I'll probably also just publish a video specific, a story time video with the background on these. Alright, so that's this. I will see you in the next army. <laughs> Alright, so let's take a look at the first army that I, I really want. This is the army I wanted to start with. So, it's <laughs> this is just a lot here. Let's just kind of start in the beginning. Here's uh, three Fire Warrior squads. All right, so uh, two Stealth Suits squads. Uh, I've got two different commanders. Uh, we've got Dark Strider, my version of him. And Ethereal. And... The drones with the blue trim, uh, two gun and two shield drones, those are the drones that I reserve for, you know, that accompany, like the ethereal or the commander. Uh, that's just a, a fluff thing that I do. Okay. Uh, six marker drones, a uh, whole slew of uh, gun drones, I think there's what, eight of them? Nine? I don't know, I can't, can't count. Uh, and then six shield drones. <clears throat> Let's see, over here, uh, the broad, the, sorry, the broadside. So, okay, <clears throat> over here, we've got the only crisis team I've got. All right, uh, now these are the Pathfinder drones, the Recon, a Grav, and two Pulse Accelerator drones. Because I've got a lot of Pathfinders, mostly because I like the model. Um, okay, so I've got five, I like to 
just look at them in terms of uh, groups of five because I can actually mix and match this uh, pulse carbines to make these larger squads. But I got five pulse carbines, a uh, squad with two pulse and uh, three rail rifle, and then two squads with two pulse carbines and three ion rifles. And then this is my uh, these are my old school miniatures that I happen to pick up in a collection. Uh, eight metal ones, and they've got five pulse carbines and a uh, three rail rifles. <clears throat> so I just kind of keep them together as much as possible because they're based similarly. I didn't want to mess up the bases that uh, came with them. All right, so those are the Pathfinders, uh, yeah, the, the traditional Pathfinders, I'll call them, because I've got also this set of ten Pathfinders that are actually uh, Cadian. Uh, guys with tow arms. These are my Gavesa Pathfinders. Here's the uh, Shazui, the commander. Okay. And the way this is built, it's, it's uh, got the three rail rifles. That's just the way I like to run them. And they've got their own devilfish. Uh, and per the fluff, they like to, you know, name their things and put. Uh, art on so there's my Polskis uh, uh, infantry markings on the tank. I have the recon drones mounted in there because I always run them with a recon drone. I just love the look of that tank with it on there. Okay, then I got three devil fish, one for the honor guard, two for the other two squads. Uh, Riptide with his two shield drones, uh, shield missile pod drones. I don't use the drones with them though. Two uh, uh, hammerheads. Now I've got them set so I can actually swap out. I've got I could trade out these to put ion cannons on each of them, and I've got one uh, top that could be a sky ray. So, all right, the first of two barracudas, second one there, a tiger shark, two remora drones, and a razor shark. Those are that's my flying circus. Um, okay, over here my crew contingent. I'll put it <clears throat> here. I've got. Uh, crude ethereal or shaman, so he counts as an ethereal. That is a shaman that counts as on she with his fighting stave. Two shapers, my crew talks rider, or, sorry, crew riders. Uh, what are these? Narlock riders, that's what they're called. Let's see. So I've got five of those on. These are the old Saurus uh, Cold One models. These are 14 of regular crew. The reason there's 14 and not 20 is that each of these models has 19 different colors on it. And uh, so it takes a lot of time to paint. Uh, these are two crew towns using the Reaper Bones uh, Hellhound models. These guys are my other crew towns using crew carnivores, but trading out their guns for a lot of converted weapons, uh, candy handy weapons. So I call these my crew bodyguard. So it's, and it's great now that hounds can be their own unit. Uh, I'll need to get two more for sure. But if I add those two hounds, I'll have a unit of 12. And that kind of works uh, as a bodyguard for a shaper or a shaman. And then this is a 20 crew blob, our two separate squads of 10 uh, crew carnivores. I use the source bodies with the crew head and crew arms. All right. Now, the last two models for the crew, uh, well, actually, there's one more behind, beside this, but these are my crew combat skiffs. Uh, th there is a sort of inspiration from uh, Star Wars on these, but I thought the skiffs looked really good. Uh, these count as piranhas. And lastly is my crew broadside. So that's my tab collection. Okay, so let's move on to the next army. All right, so there's a third army I began as the uh, guard, and <clears throat> essentially it's a it is a, just a collection of models because uh, I did, I'm not able to really build uh, particular units because I want to be able to have a lot of flexibility. Uh, so I am short models, though I do need more to do all everything I want. But anyway, so I did kind of arrange, and there's one real platoon. Uh, you know, three squads with the heavy bolters plus the command squad. Over here, <clears throat> Creed and Kel. The three uh, regimental advisors. 
Uh, I got four snipers, uh, two uh, regular lads, extra, actually five extra lads, lads gunners, um, extra voxcaster, a medic, two heavy and two light flamers, a couple NCOs and another captain, uh, four, three, sorry, three mortar teams, uh, missile launcher team, three auto cannon teams. Now over here I've got some uh, ogrins. Uh, these are inspired by the uh, Polish or Slavic uh, mythology or legends of forest giants called Weshi. So now I've got for them, um, I've got three autocannon chimeras. Uh, these actually I have three regular turrets as well, so I can have six uh, multi melta or sorry, multi laser chimeras. But here's three standard chimeras over here. I've got three, what I call fire salamanders. They're one of the first conversions I did in the guard, uh, <clears throat> making up my own unit. These actually do represent a lead, uh, tank destroyer, Lehman Rust tank destroyer. Over here, chymodons. Um, these are I usually do a stand-in as a uh, conqueror, Lehman Rust conqueror. And then over here, I've got an annihilator and two vanquishers. So that is the sum total of the guard army I've got so far. Ooh, except for a couple flyers. Hmm, let me look at those. I couldn't believe I forgot these. <laughs> All right, so the flyers, um, I used two dust models, uh, the Flader Moose models. Uh, now that 8th edition, they really changed the profile for the lightning. And so I've, I'm going to have to redo, I forget which one. Uh, I think it's this one. Because uh, the gun arrangement... It's significantly different now. Um, the options are different. Now over here is the Malkador. Uh, I've got it made so I can I can swap some some weapons systems out. But that's the only super heavy I've gotten in the army. All right. So now let's try that again. This is my guard collection. All right. So anyway, let's move on to the next army. Okay. Here's the first part of my Exodite army. And it's the Eldar. Part. So we'll go ahead and start with the uh, Farseer, a couple Warlocks, a couple Spirit Seers, um, 20 Guardians, 12 Storm Guardians, uh, 10, 10, 10, and 10 other uh, Guardian squads. Um, these guys count as my, oh, what do you call them? Uh, scorpion, Striking Scorpions. I do have Jet Bikes in this one. And then there's my Exodite Knight, which counts as the Wraith Knight. Okay. Now over here I've got the Outcasts, uh, Illic Knight Spear, and five Rangers. Um, I use the Dryad figures to make uh, Spriggans, which are which kind of represent the Wraith Guard. So these are the Wraith Guard, and these are Wraith Blades. Sorry, other way around. Wraith Blades, Wraith Guard. And then these are two Warlords. Uh, sorry, Wraith Lords, duh. Um, that's the Juthu kit, and uh, this is a Woodland Phoenix metal tree with some sculpting work done to actually make a face and uh, the claws and what have you. So that's the Eldar portion of my army. Small collection it is, but uh, there wasn't a lot that I could do conversion-wise or exit-wise with the Eldar Codex straight up. Okay, all right, so let's take a look at the next part. Did it again. Forgot a couple things. <laughs> so for the other, I also have three War Walkers and two uh, Volzrath support batteries, which is two for each. All right. So add those to the picture you just saw. <laughs> okay. So the second part of my Exodite <coughs> army was actually uh, inspired by the Tyranny Codex. So let's just kind of <laughs> go through everything real quick. Uh, this is mostly going to be models that aren't part of GW's line, so uh, bear with me as we go through here. <clears throat> now this uh, is a GW model. It's an old metal uh, Stegadon. Uh, this counts as a Carnifex. It also can count as a Wraith Lord uh, in the other uh, list. That is a GW model conversion that uh, became the Biovore. These Dragon Riders and these are the Tyranid Warriors. Those are the Tyranid Shrikes. So those are the GW models uh, that really, with the, oh yeah, there's also these, what I call the Gene Stealers. Uh, they stand as the Gene Stealers. They're uh, Black Arc Corsairs. 
those are the actual GW models uh, that represent Tyranids. But now, uh, <clears throat> there's a Merliton, I think, is the name. There's a model there that uh, counts the blood, what is it, the Broodlord. Then three Zoanthropes. There's a Lindbergh model, uh, counts an Exocrine. Another, I think it's Lindbergh model, uh, with some GW uh, Elder components to count as a Turvagon. A whole ton of, uh, I think it's Coruscant miniatures. Uh, Dromaeosaurs, here's another. Uh, Dromaeosaurs standing either as uh, Termagants or Hermagants, depending on the list, until I actually get a Termagant uh, model from, with a dinosaur. A couple, uh, oh man, I forget this. I think this is also Coruscant. Uh, they are a couple Triceratops that are a Tyrant Guard. And it's a Reaper Bones Dragon, the Pathfinder Dragon, with a GW uh, Kit Bash. Uh, that's my Dragon Lord, basically. He counts as the Swarm Lord. And that's all uh, a GW figure on top, a rider. I don't know where these are, came from. Those are Velociraptors, act as Raveners. <clears throat> these are Spore Mines. Uh, they're essentially the flasks from the uh, Wraith Knight kit. Uh, small ones, and these are mucolid spores, uh, the larger flasks from the Wraith Knight kit. Okay, <clears throat> and then here, I don't remember who made this offhand, um, QFR, I think, or something like that. These are Coelophysis models. These count as um, Ripper Swarms. These are Reaper Bones, also count as Ripper Swarms, but these are Ripper Swarms that are actually uh, have the spine fists. So. These are bombardier beetles swarms. Okay, so that is the Exodite list or collection representing the Tyranid Codex. All right, now to the last Exodite element. All right, and finally the last of the Exodites. The, it took me the longest to figure out how to bring these guys in. These are the Dark Eldar Codex versions of the Exodites. So, start down here real quick with uh, Lilith. Two Archons. Uh, these are my Dragon Warriors, they count as Incubi. Uh, they're just Exodites wearing dragon masks. Good old fashioned uh, Glade Guard. Really retro Glade Guard. Uh, some more con Glade Guard conversions. Uh, nice and a Reaper. These kind of, these will stand in here, but I use these for my Mordheim games. <clears throat> here I've got some, uh, these will count as Witches or. Uh, Blood Brides, whatever they're, they're called. These are my version of Hellions. Okay. There's the first unit of... Uh, oh, what do you call those things? I can't remember what they're called now. Uh, i got two of them. Uh, scourges. Oh, yeah. These have the heavy weapons, all the haywire blasters. These don't. Over here, I've got a Webway Chariot that counts as a Ravager, as well as one, two regular Ravagers. And in the back, I'll start over here. Got two uh, venoms, and then a whole series of unique uh, raiders, all different types, uh, configurations, sails, and what have you. This one's actually got the sail in the wrong place. <laughs> anyway, so, and then finally, <clears throat> my version of the, uh, I believe it's the Kronos. It's the one that. Uh, Dishes out the uh, has a siphon, soul siphon, and it dishes out the feel no pain bonus. All right, so <clears throat> that's the sum total of my Exodite army that uh, uses the Codex for the Eld Dark Elder. So that's it. All right, so this is really <laughs> this is the entirety of my Skitari army. Five guys. Uh, you know, just no conversion work here. Just built straight as, painted up just as uh, we'd be in the box. It's the only set that I really ever considered doing that way. But anyway, um, the reason I have these is because I was working on a narrative campaign requiring the use of several tech priests. And so here are the other five Skitari, uh, but heavily converted to make an um, explorer uh, tech priest with. Uh, Four others. That's a Magus, uh, Explorer Magus. But so those five guys are 
uh, the, it can be used them as tech priests in my guard army if I want, though they don't quite fit uh, the theme because mine's a renegade uh, army and the Mechanicum wouldn't be part of that group. Okay, all right. Now, finally, this is the rest of the Electra Priest bodies that I used or had after doing the Tech Priests, and these are uh, I call them Tech Priest novices, and they count as servitors when I use the Tech Priests. Um, but they have a special uh, rule set when they're in the narrative campaign that I've got. All right, so that's kind of some oddball units I've got. Okay, so I hope uh, you enjoyed seeing all of that. Uh, try to keep it short. Uh, did not take up too much of your time, but uh, if you are interested in seeing any of those in more detail, there's a bunch of playlists uh, for each army, uh, or there is a playlist for each army, so you can go in a lot more detail and take a look at those different uh, units and models and what have you. Now, the final question is completely off topic, <laughs> so which from this anyway, but I thought it's kind of neat. Um, all right, so. Let's take a look at what Idik Beer has asked. His question uh, is, have I ever been to the UK, and what country that I have been to is my favorite? Now, this is uh, kind of an eye-opener, um, at least for me, because the first part of the question is, no, I have not been to the UK, uh, though I do want to for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but the question itself, you know, which of all the, of the countries I visited, which was my favorite? I realized I don't really travel much. Uh, travel within the U.S. Um, quite a bit for different reasons, uh, but the only country I've ever visited has been Canada, and even that wasn't to like go to one of the cities or what have you. That was to go on a wilderness canoe trip for eight to nine days. I did that twice uh, when I was in. Uh, junior and senior in high school, or just just about gra after I graduated high, high school, and so it's like I don't I, I can't say I have a favorite because it's the only country I've visited was Canada, and really the only you know fairness I didn't visit Canada, the country so much you know as far as the you know interacting a lot with the people, there was interaction during the day of arriving and during the time day we were leaving, but not during the nine days of the trip you know. So I don't really have a fair way to really see what is the country like. So I can't say I have a favorite yet. Um, maybe when the kids are growing up and what have you, maybe there'll be a way to do some traveling because there are a couple of places I do want to go to. Uh, but again, I'm not, a, not a, I'm not big on traveling. I like home, and when I like to, when I go to travel, it's usually to go fishing um, and to go to a natural spots where. You know, I'll visit like Yellowstone Park or what have you um, to just look at the natural beauty and fish because I love fishing. Uh, so that's kind of where it stands. Now, if I do ever get to the UK, there's a, it's going to have to be a long trip because there is a lot I want to see. There's a lot of history there, and there's a lot of you know I've seen in movies and shows, and I want to I want to experience it you know, the country more than just having a, like a European tour, you know, you're in each country for a day or two and then boom, it's, that's a whirlwind. You don't really get to appreciate it. I like to take some time because my parents actually did visit uh, Ireland and at one point, so uh, it would be nice if I was able to, to go to U the UK and whatever. And it'd be great to uh, go to, <clears throat> you know, see the, you know, 40K where it's, where it lives, you know what I mean? Uh, it'd be nice to see some of you, uh, the YouTube channels that are over there as well. Uh, whether it's stopping by the different uh, stores that I hear about or whether it's actually going to Warhammer World or if maybe we can touch base uh, if it ever happens just actually a range of time we can get together but anyway so maybe there will be come a time where I will do more traveling but right now sorry just Canada and really lots of trees moose bear eagle fish that's what, I, that's what I remember about Canada. Okay. All right. So that's the sum total of the questions we had this month. Uh, so I was, I've been thinking. I had a question lined up, and uh, someone actually stole that question already. Um, I forget which one it is. I'm not going to. Uh, it just happens that, you know, other channels, I'm sure doing some of the kind of same thing, which is uh, there's nothing new under the sun. So 
What I thought, though, uh, would be kind of a nice thing to ask, and I'm cu actually entirely curious, of all the hobbies that are out there, what is it about tabletop gaming? Not Maybe not just 40K or whatever, just tabletop gaming in general, okay? What is it that made you want to do that as opposed to something else? And here's the reason I asked the question. <clears throat> I made a list one day of my hobbies, and there were over 30. And I'm not going to bore you with the list. Uh, but it's like I didn't settle and until very <clears throat> very late in life when money started drying up because kids started getting older and more expensive. Um, kind of narrowed down. So my hobby list is much, much shorter right now. So it was curious that I realized why I settled on this one hobby of tabletop gaming as opposed to some of the others hobbies I have that I know I'll get back into once the kids are moved on and I've got more time and more cash and stuff. Okay. So what is it that drew you draws you to your tabletop hobby as opposed to any other hobbies you may have been interested in or may have done in the past? Yeah. Alright, so with that, please comment below, let me know what you think, and we'll just see what comes up and we'll see you in the next month's Q and A, if not before. Alright, bye bye.